Good morning, everybody. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, Fresnel lenses and uh, give you a complete overview of the whole uh, history and the properties of Fresnel lenses and how they apply to the Point Vicente Lighthouse. We're going to get the lens here, as you know, uh, sometime later this year and as soon as the construction is done in the other room here. So we're getting ready to um, uh, have talking points for you so that when we do get the lens that you'll know all the background of it, okay? And so my friend Cole Bacon and I are going to uh, present today and about 50-50. And uh, so he's helped me put this presentation together and it's going to be a, a great joint presentation. Okay, a little bit about Fresnel lenses. First of all, the very first uh, lighthouse uh, was the Lighthouse of Alexandria off the coast of uh, Egypt at the mouth of the Nile River, okay, where the uh, uh, harbor of Alexandria is. And uh, that was a very large tower that they built, and the tower was built out of uh, limestone blocks. It was about 40 stories tall. That's pretty big for those days, right, considering it's unsupported masonry. They didn't have any steel framework or anything like that. This is pretty big. It was one of, considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world because it was so gigantic. And there was a gigantic bonfire that was put into the top of it. And that was the light for the warehouse, the lighthouse. I keep saying warehouse. If I say warehouse, I mean lighthouse. I don't know why I do this. Somehow it's, it's just ingrained in my head. <laughs> All right. So anyway, it's lighthouse. So uh, uh, basically, uh, the legend says that it could be seen for 100 miles. We don't think so. And the reason for that is the curvature of the Earth uh, is about 36 miles at about the height that that particular uh, uh, lighthouse was, OK? Chances are it couldn't be seen past the curvature of the Earth, OK? Who knows, though? Anyway, that's what they say. So they used a uh, bronze uh, parabolic mirror. Can you hold up the mirror there? Okay, this is a parabolic mirror. Okay, and the idea is that was a reflector that was behind the great big bonfire and that hopefully uh, helped uh, to reflect the light and uh, it was fixed with no flashes and required a whole bunch of wood fuel. I don't know where they got the wood fuel. No idea. Must have come from Africa all the way down the Nile River. And then uh, this was on an island out in the middle of the harbor, so they had to ferry it out to the island. And then they had a dumb waiter, not a smart waiter, that, uh, that pulled all this stuff up to the top of the lighthouse, right? Pretty interesting. Then a big earthquake came in uh, the year 1303, damaged the lighthouse real bad, so bad that 72 years later it collapsed in uh, 1375 and then they they decided that those uh, blocks that they had used were val valuable and so they built a fort or a uh, fortress or a citadel on that island pharos island in the harbor of alexandria with that uh, lighthouse okay see the problem of, of early lighthouses was all of them were open flame lights open flame lights they had no electricity they had no other uh, light source other than flames. And you know, when you uh, look at this, it looks pretty bright right here, but if you were out to sea 20 miles, would you be able to see that? Probably not, huh? And the same way here, this is burning an oil lamp. Would you be able to see that? It's a little bit brighter than the fire. No, you can't. How about candles? The same way, right? Pretty hard. So early uh, lighthouse illumination had these things set up like this, and only 3% of a flame would be directed towards the observer, which would be the mariner out in the sea. Why? Because, well, the flame is here and the, the light is going all different directions all over the place. And it's not directed towards the observer, right, which is going to be the mariner out in the, in the sea. All right, so only 3%. That's not good enough. The mariners themselves were, were depending on these lighthouses to keep them away from hazards like rocks over here at Point Vicente, or like sandbars at Cape Hatteras, for example, or other places like that. Uh, Cape Hatteras, by the way, is known as the graveyard of the Atlantic because that's so many ships uh, went down out there because that lighthouse was not functional. Okay, so big problem with that. Okay. Uh, 
in the early days, uh, they used uh, flames and they had these big braziers like this, okay? And uh, although there's a big fire there, it's not as big as the one in the uh, bonfire at the top of the Alexandria Lighthouse, and so it couldn't be seen very far away. But it was an early attempt to, to have some kind of light so that they could keep uh, the ships away from the hazards. In uh, Norway and, and Sweden, they developed this thing called vipifiers, and they used a basket like this and put uh, coals in it and other kinds of wood to try and make it as bright as possible. Uh, it didn't always work that well, uh, and uh, many ships went down, even in the little fjords in Norway and all those other things, because these things weren't bright enough. Okay? Uh, Kel's going to talk to you about the uh, rest of them here. There we go. The reason we have two microphones is one is for you and one is for the video. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Cole. Uh, so in the 1540s, they started to use candle arrays and chandeliers as opposed to um, the open flame uh, sources. And uh, later in the 1760s, they used oil as opposed to candles and open flames. And they burned whale oil and sometimes vegetable oil. Uh, and then in the 1760s as well, they also developed something called the spider oil pan, uh, which had 10 wicks. They were all coated in oil, and it was much brighter than anything they had previously used. And that also burned whale oil. And then in 1782, we get the Aragon fountain oil lamp. This is much more sophisticated in construction, as you can see. Uh, you can see the ring at the top, that was used to draw air in from the outside and inside to the wick so that um, the flame would be brighter. And also they used capillary action to draw the oil in from here and completely coat the wick. They wanted to coat the wick with oil so that they weren't burning the actual wick because that would have led um, to using a lot more wick and they didn't want to do that. So then in 1811, the Stevenson's fountain oil lamp was invented. And what was very special about this is that it included uh, parabolic reflectors. These, um, like Paul said earlier, only 3% of light is usually directed towards the mariner. And what these did, it would capture light from behind the light source that would have gone wasted, and it directs it out to sea, which was uh, pretty revolutionary at the time. And then in 1823, we have the Fresnel Ergo concentric wick. Uh, what this was, it was an arrangement of five wicks in concentric circles, and that uh, really made it much more bright. And then we also have this development here, which included a pump for uh, bringing the oil to the wick more efficiently. And in 1844, uh, we have the Winslow Lewis lamp right here. And what this did, it used gravity. It had this reservoir right here of oil, and it used gravity to draw it down and up into the wick. So what we're really trying to do here is keep the wick covered in oil. And then in 1888, someone named Joseph Funk, who was the foreman at the uh, New York State Lighthouse Board uh, maintenance shop, he used his knowledge to create his own lamp, as you can see here. And what was special about this lamp was that it uh, had this construction with a flame spreader here. So with the same type of uh, lamp, it was able to spread out the flames and make a brighter light. And all of these lights that I'm telling you about are more bright than the one previous. And all right, now we're getting even more sophisticated. In 1837, we have the Wilkins pneumatic oil lamp, which you can see here. It used an air chamber and an oil reservoir to uh, well, the air chamber was used to push up against the oil reservoir and into the wick, which would then be uh, light on fire. And similarly, in 1840, we have Fillorier's hydrostatic oil lamp, which instead of using an air chamber, had a uh, chamber filled with solution of sulfate of zinc. And what that did was similar to the air chamber. It pushed down on the oil, in turn drying it up into the lamp. And again, in 1853, we have Mead's hydraulic oil lamp, which used a pump at the bottom to pump the oil into the uh, lamp at the top. And that, again, made it much more efficient to use. 
All right, and then in 1869, Joseph Funk, who previously had a lamp I talked about, he improved it. No, no, no relation, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. So he improved his lamp uh, by incorporating hydraulics. As you can see, there is this uh, lever here that you would pump the oil with. And then in 1868, this is a very exciting lamp. You can see it has 108 jets burning gas. And you can imagine that was extremely bright, extremely hot. In fact, when they first put that in a lens, the glass started to crack. So they had to make a special lens just for this lamp. All right, and then in 1870, we have kerosene becoming more available. So we start to incorporate that as a fuel source in uh, Doty's kerosene lamp. And in the year 1900, we start uh, using uh, air pressure to um, aid in uh, delivering the kerosene to the flame. And also in 1876, Joseph Funk further uh, develops his lamp to incorporate kerosene as well. And now 1896, we've started to use acetylene gas. And what this did, it um, used acetylene gas and it produced bright flashes of uh, acetylene gas. It produced a bright flash of flame and then stopped and then a flash and then a stop. And that is what was uh, why there's this flasher mechanism here. And the regulator controlled that uh, mechanism. And then in 1907, uh, we have the sun valve that was invented. What that did, it was able to detect when it's light out and when you didn't need to use this lamp because it was light out. And it was able to shut off the flow of acetylene gas to the lamp. And that actually won the Nobel Prize of Physics in that year. Um, in 1898, I'm sure we've all seen something similar to that construction. We have the incandescent oil vapor lamp. And what that did was it atomized its oil and was able to uh, burn it off in a brighter fashion. Yeah, if, if I could ask you to keep the questions until the end of the presentation, I'd appreciate it because of the video. Okay, and we will have a Q&A session at the end, okay? Thank you. All right. Then we get into the age of electricity, hopefully. And uh, the big problem was that uh, uh, electricity was really not available until 1857. No light bulbs and no electric arc lights yet, right? And uh, it required a big steam or internal combustion engine of some kind to turn the generator, or magneto generator, whichever one it was. All right, in those days they had these ancient magnetoelectric generators, which were the very first ones that came around, and the dynamo generator that we use today, uh, not the alternator, but the generator, was uh, invented in 1866 by George Siemens, and it, the, it was the first reliable and constant power source but it still required an engine of some kind, like a steam engine or an internal combustion engine to turn the generator of some kind. Okay, that dramatically increased the cost of operation and maintenance of a, of a lighthouse, if the, you were to do that. And it made it impractical for lighthouses that were out on rocks in the middle of the ocean somewhere. Right, so like uh, Bell's Rock uh, right off the coast of Wales, for example, in Britain, and uh, St. George's Light uh, off the coast of uh, uh, Crescent City in California, all those were offshore, right? And Anacapa Island right offshore from us, but it would have made it very difficult to have that kind of installation. So electrically lit lighthouses were pretty slow to be adopted because of this, and uh, even though the light that was produced by electricity was far better than any flame-based light. It was very difficult for them to justify the cost. See, you'd have to have a great big steam engine like this with a belt-driven thing and running your great big giant generator of some kind, one of these right here. See how big they are? They're huge in those days. Now we have them about the size of a coffee can that you put inside your car, right? And it drives the electrical system in your car. But in those days, that was all they had. So here is Point Vicente's installation about uh, 1930, all right? And you can see that we've got two big machines here. One, one big one here is actually an air compressor that drives the foghorn. 
That's all that's for. It just drives the foghorn. It's got a great big flywheel, two flywheels on it, and the idea of that is once you get it moving, then the inertia of the, of the wheel keeps it going and it doesn't take as much horsepower to turn it. Right? And then over here is the actual generator, and it was, they had an internal combustion engine here, a gas engine, that was running the generator, and that uh, powered the light itself and the motor, the electric motor that turned the light, rotated the light. But that was all that they could do, and I'll show you a little more about that in a minute, right? So, moving, moving from there. Uh, in the, the first electric lamps that were available in lighthouses were electric arc lamps. Consider that what we've got is uh, two great big pieces of carbon like this that are electrically charged, negative and positive, and when they come together, they create a huge spark of some kind, and that was good for a while, but the problem is that sooner or later burns the tips off of those things, and when the gap gets to be wider than it needs to be, the, the connection is not made anymore and there's no more light. And so they developed these very elaborate systems to actually uh, keep the points together. So constantly it was adjusting the points and moving them closer together with these clockwork systems that they had here. Okay? Finally, uh, Thomas Edison developed, after 10,000 tries and failures, uh, developed the uh, modern electric lamp and, uh, with tungsten filaments, tungsten carbide filaments. Eventually, they developed a 1,000 watt version like this, okay, and there were either even higher uh, wattages later on, but uh, in, uh, that wasn't available until about 1904. And uh, that was the first one available. And then back, back in 1952, we finally got halogen lights, which are far more reliable and last a lot longer. Their service life is a lot longer. And that's what we're using today is halogen lights, okay? But it was a long time before we got that. All right, uh, this is Point Vicente's illumination. In uh, uh, 1952 to today, they're using the halogen lamp. And we have a video a little later. We can actually show you the lamp itself lit uh, inside the lens. And so we'll, we'll go to that in a little while. Uh, this is a two bulb automatic lamp changer. And these are 1,000 watt bulbs. Uh, and when one goes out, the other one automatically comes on. OK, so uh, back, this is an ancient photo from the uh, Palos Verdes Library District uh, showing uh, the uh, installation back in about 1932 to 35, thereabouts. And what happened was the generator could power the tower and the uh, uh, movement of the light, the rotation of the light and the light itself, but there wasn't enough leftover electricity to power these buildings, and so they all had to be lit with kerosene lamps. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Until 1935, finally Edison Company came around the peninsula from San Pedro and hooked them up with electricity and then they were able to build that. And not only did they build that, but they also built a radio station here. In those days, radio was very important uh, method of navigation for ships, right? Today, we have radar and many other kinds of uh, technologies that have completely supplanted the radio. Uh, so all the radio gear is still in storage over in Terminal Island at the Coast Guard facility over there, all right? All right, let's, let's uh, let uh, Cole, uh, go through here and talk a little bit more about this. All right, so now we've talked about the light sources themselves. Um, now we have a problem. How do you take that? Uh, it's a relatively low power uh, flame light. How do you take that? How do you make it so it's bright enough so you can see it from s the ocean? And how do you project it far enough away from the hazard you're trying to get sailors to avoid? How do you do that? Well, first we have some terms that we'd like you to get comfortable with. Um, reflection, that we all know what that is. It's the change in direction of light at a particular surface, so just bouncing off a mirror or something like that. What's important about that is that um, the light loses half of its intensity with each time it's reflected, so keep that in mind. Um, refraction, that is how light appears to bend in some circumstances, uh, which is caused by it changing speed in order to get from a point A to a point B most efficiently. So if you think about um, like a lake and you're looking at a fish, 
and the fish seems to be right at the surface, even though it's a few feet below. That's actually due to the fact that the light traveling from the fish to the surface appears to go more vertical at first, and then when it's at the surface, it goes to your eye. So that's the curve right there. That's what for a refraction is. Uh, next, we have collimated light. This is very important for what we're talking about today. Uh, collimated light is what lenses try to do. Um, it is light whose rays are parallel and directed in one direction. So you can see here, uh, we have a lens here that gathers light that would have gone in all different directions, and it collimates it so that it's all parallel in the same direction. Diffraction is another important term in light theory. Uh, it's how light appears to spread out from a slit in a wall. So say you have a wall here, there's a slit right here, and your light source is coming and pointing at it like this. And instead of just going and continuing in a straight line right there, the light actually spreads out, and that is diffraction. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, interference is another important term. Uh, it's when you have multiple light waves interacting. And when the peaks and troughs of those waves coincide, that emphasizes their brightness. And if those peaks and troughs are not aligned and um, just separated, they can actually cancel out their strength and uh, make the light appear less bright. Polarization is also important. So light, as we know, uh, travels in one direction. But along that direction, you have uh, these waves. And the waves are not all oriented in the same direction. They're all around that one line that goes forward, like you can see here. But polarizing that light is refining it, so that while it still goes in the same one direction, all of the waves are oriented in the same plane. So uh, way back in 1690, there was a Dutch physicist named Christian Huygens who proposed first in his treatise on light that light would travel in waves. And he was able to mathematically prove some aspects of this. Uh, he first described it as a radiating wave front and that they would travel in longitudinal waves, which is almost correct. <laughs> and then Isaac Newton comes along in 1704 and he says, that doesn't make sense. Why would light travel in waves? I'm going to disprove that. And he came up with the corpuscular theory of light, which stipulates that all luminous objects, the sun, a flashlight, anything, it emits tiny little spheres called corpuscles. And these corpuscles travel out from the luminous object in straight lines in all directions, not waves. And he said that the different sizes of these corpuscles correspond to color, and um, that they are elastic, which could explain reflection, which means that if it hits something, it will bounce off. And so he was able to explain reflection with this theory. However, he was unable to explain diffraction, polarization, and interference. So eventually, his theory was dismissed. But it was accepted, and it was the main theory of light for quite some time. All right, so here we have Augustin Jean Fresnel. He is a French physicist, and the reason we're all here today, um, he was a professor, and he was a brilliant optical engineer. His day-to-day -day job, however, it was a career with the French government to um, actually build roads and bridges and manage the people that did that. And he really did not like that. He did not, mani he did not like managing people. That was not what he liked to do. And so he turned to lights and optics as his passion. That's what he did on the side, and that's what he's most known for. He helped discover polarization and diffraction. He helped explain how that is possible. And what we're all here today for is his Fresnel lens. He created that, and what it did was it was able to collimate light or make it all parallel. And he was able to do that over very long distances very efficiently. Unfortunately, though, he suffered from tuberculosis and died at the young age of 39. A little bit more about his early life. He was born in Normandy in the north of France at the time of the French Revolution. And he and his brothers all went to technical schools fo focused on math and science and engineering. And this is what led him into that career he really didn't like with the core of bridges and roads. And so he was never really happy with that, but he was passionate about the study of light. 
So on his own, separate from Huygens, he had never heard of the guy when he first proposed that light travels in waves. He thought of it more of a solution, an explanation to diffraction. And he proposed that light traveled in transverse waves because there are two forces acting on it. You have the whoops, you have the electric force and the magnetic force, which both pull the light in two different directions, which causes it to go in a wave. He also helped explain how we perceive colors, which is because of the different wavelengths. So in 1819, the French Academy of Sciences uh, had a competition to see who could explain diffraction. And Fresnel, he said, okay, yeah, I know why it is. It's because light travels in waves. And he was able to uh, mathematically prove that. And this was one of the first times that was ever uh, happened. And so uh, he won the grand prize in 1819, and he became a celebrity in the field of optics because of that. So this experiment here helps explain diffraction and interference. Um, it was created by the English physicist Thomas Young. It's called the double slit experiment. And so you can see here you have a wall with a slit, like I showed you before, and the light source coming in. And again, instead of going in a perfectly straight line here, it actually expands out, and uh, that's what diffraction is. And then you see here there's actually a second wall with two slits. And what this does is it creates multiple different wave fronts. And what this helps us explain is interference. So you can see here you have a lighter spot and a darker spot, and a lighter spot and a darker spot, and that is coinciding with when the light waves interact and when they uh, are putting each other against each other. All right, so now we have some demonstrations we'd like to uh, show you. All right, so the first one we have, uh, this is a single candle in a glass chimney to illustrate some of the earlier technology that would have been used in lighthouses. So you can see it's giving off light, but you know, not super bright. See, could you see this? <laughs> <laughs> OK, and then back in that day, they thought, OK, that wasn't bright enough, so let's do a bunch of them. And so this next uh, demonstration is just four candles in a glass chimney. And you can see it's definitely brighter, but still, would you see that out at sea? Probably not. Yeah. And so they, th they realized that wasn't bright enough and that they had to do something about it. So what they did was they set up these parabolic reflectors that would capture some of the light that would have been unused and try to reflect it back to where they're trying to shoot the light. And that helped a lot, it did, but still wasn't super great. Now we have uh, light through a triangular non-chromatic prism. It's non-chromatic, meaning it doesn't break it into separate colors. Okay, so this is just black and white. So when you put, put it up here like this and you rotate the prism in a certain way, what does it do? It bends the light. So that is the illustration of the property of refraction, bending the light waves, okay? Very important for the Fresnel lens because it actually grabs light waves which would normally be lost inside of a, of a lantern tower and it focuses them and collimates them forward towards the observer who is the mariner out at sea. All right. And then we have the uh, one slit cardboard thing. Okay. So 
this is more of an interpretation of that experiment I just showed you. Um, Go ahead. Uh, so this is supposed to illustrate um, how diffraction, you can almost see it. Um, the light would spread out from here and do that. Of course, it's not perfect, but um, like I said before, instead of going in a perfectly straight line through that slit, it actually expands after it reaches that slit. And then also, like I showed you on the previous slide, uh, when you have these two slits in the cardboard, like this, uh, that is supposed to illustrate uh, interference and in how there's brighter spots and darker spots. But of course, our homemade little experiment here isn't perfect for that. Um, but that is what the experiment essentially is. Yeah. Okay, so um, polarization, like I mentioned, is very important. And as you know, it's often found in sunglasses. And as you can see, this is an unpolarized lens right here. And you can see it's not super focused. It's kind of hazy. And um, it's not super great for blocking out light. And then with a polarized sunglass, it's a little bit more defined and clear. It um, refines the light that goes through it so that it's only oriented in one direction. And of course, this isn't exactly a perfect illustration of that, but you can kind of see it's a bit more defined through the polarized lens. And this is a plano convex lens, which means plano on one side, it's flat on one side, and convex, it's curved on the other side. And this will help illustrate how you collimate light, how you make it so it's focused in one direction and the rays are parallel. And you can see that spot in the middle, that is the very collimated light. So this is what a lot of uh, lighthouse lenses are trying to do. They collimate the light. And so here we have a miniature model of the lens that is found in the Point Vicente lighthouse. Uh, it's known as a clamshell lens because of its construction, you can see. Um, and it actually, this one has a nice little light in it, too. If the light was brighter, you could probably project it through the roof. Yeah. All right. So I've got one more term for you. Candle power. What is candle power? Essentially, it's just how bright something is. Uh, it's measured in candelas, and what is a candela? It's a, the international unit of luminous intensity in a given direction of a source that emits monochromatic radiation of a frequency of blah, 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 blah. You don't need to know that, just remember that candle power is how bright something is. Now, you might think candle power is one of the only factors that uh, determines how far out a light can be seen, but there are actually many other uh, factors that determine that. Uh, elevation above sea level is very important. The higher up you are, the further out it can be projected. So for reference, Point Vicente, the lighthouse is about 185 feet above sea level. Also, simple things like the cleanliness of the lens and the light bulb and just the windows in the lantern room. If those are cleaner, it can be projected a lot farther. Also, just the local atmosphere. You know, if it's foggy outside, you probably won't be able to project as far. That's pretty much a given. Uh, also, how fast the lens is rotating is also very important. Uh, if it's rotating more slowly, it can be seen further. All right, and here is Paul. Okay, so uh, we use parabolic reflectors uh, originally uh, like this, 
Okay, and again, that was used on the, as far back as the Lighthouse of Alexandria, but also uh, they refined them later and developed a parabolic shape, uh, which did uh, collimate the light to a certain extent, and it brought it up to 39% of the light that was uh, generated was available to be seen by the mariner, which isn't bad but is not good enough for the mariners because it didn't keep them off the rocks or off the sandbars, okay? About 50% of the light is lost when the light changes direction. So that's a big problem with reflectors. So in order to mitigate that, they did big arrays of reflectors like this. And they used either oil lamps or candles and they had 15 or 20 different uh, uh, reflectors and those were supposedly brighter but not really. You know, it was a very dull light that was, uh, just happened to be big. And you couldn't see it more than four or five miles offshore. Okay? So the idea uh, was to have a convex lens like this so that you could collimate the light. And we showed you an example of the convex lens. Okay, but in order to build one of those for a lighthouse to collimate the light, the thing would have to be about five feet tall and about four feet thick and weigh something like, you know, 2,000 pounds. And not only that, it'd have to be completely free of any bubbles or any waves or anything. It'd have to be optically pure. And so to grind a lens like that with the technology of the day that they had was impossible. And they realized they couldn't do that. Fresnel in 1820, 1820 decided that uh, this was not an option. So he came up with this option. The idea was to take away the material that wasn't used, uh, wasn't needed to actually do the uh, magnification and collimation, and he uh, developed a Fresnel lens like this. Okay, this is the same exact properties as this one, except in a much uh, smaller package, much lighter weight, and easier to uh, uh, make a lens out of. So here's how it works: you have a light source, and we have these different uh, uh, lenses in here that are built in different prisms and the prisms capture the light from this light source. So instead of being random going all different directions, it captures that so that it's pointing it in one particular direction right out to the sea. All right. So uh, the kinds of uh, prisms that they use were dioptric prisms. That's the uh, kind of thing based on refraction of light. Remember, that's bending the light waves, as we looked at before, right, through the prism. And that focuses the light through the lens and uh, not reflecting it off of a mirror of any kind. And that utilizes more of the light and points it in the right direction. Then they had catadioptric uh, prisms, and that's the combined use of reflection and refraction and captures light that would otherwise be lost. And then in the center is the bullseye or the focusing lens, and that's the one that actually, when you see a flash of the lighthouse, that's what you're seeing. You're seeing the bullseye lens. So it looks this way. The bullseye is in the center, you have dioptric prisms on both sides, and finally you have catadioptric prisms that are capturing the rest of the light. See, so this is a, a tremendous um, advancement uh, over other systems of the day. So what's a, what's a lens look like, a Fresnel lens? Well, it's either barrel shaped or clamshell shaped and it encircles the light source. And uh, the air, area immediately horizontal to the light source, they use dioptric lenses and that magnifies and concentrates the light, points it in the right direction, and then at the same time, above and below the light source, which was where the, the light would normally go out of the window or something like that, is captured in catadioptric prisms and pointed in that same direction and redirected. So that dramatically increased the light output uh, for as much as 80% of the light transmitted over 20 miles to sea. Okay, now here's the original um, uh, prototype that uh, Fresnel built in 1819 he had a very, very difficult time finding glass manufacturers that would build him quality glass with no bubbles in it and no waves in it, right? Very difficult in the technology of the day. He finally found a local uh, area, a local uh, glass maker in Paris, and they built all of these uh, polygon prisms and put them together in a big circle. Eventually, he got them to build circular 
uh, things like this. And it, this is the way that it turned out to be later. And they actually built one piece lenses later that looked like this. But this was his original prototypes. So you end up with a bullseye portion of the lens which focuses the beam intensely and really causes it to go way out to sea. All right, so 80% of the light goes towards the observer in a Fresnel lens. Remember, 3% of the light only if there's no lens, right? 39% if you have some kind of a reflector behind it, and 80% if you have a Fresnel lens. What a difference. What a difference.